And as you can see, the message today is from brokenness to wholeness. I just want to continue this uh, part seven. So I will be touching on some of the things that we have discussed previously, reinforcing some of the truths. How many of you have seen the movie Unbroken? Awesome movie. I hope you can see this movie. It's not a Christian movie, but it's a movie of courage, of resisting. It's a war, American war hero. It's a true story. Uh, the, the man uh, um, has been testifying, has been acknowledged, received a medal. And uh, he has resisted, has refused to be broken under the torture of the Japanese in the war. And after the war, um, he came back to the U.S., he received Jesus Christ uh, through a Billy Graham uh, crusade. And he returned to Japan to talk to his torturers about forgiveness. It's awesome. But you don't see that part in the movie, really. Uh, it's, it's, you have to search on YouTube to find the, the, what happened after. But the movie is more about the, what he went through. He refused to be broken. But today, uh, we know that we live in a broken world. And you and I, we have been broken by the power of sin. And God wants us to lift up our head this morning and hope and know that He is on our side and He has good intention for us. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. So I want to turn on our first text from the book of Leviticus and read this text. Live no longer as they do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life of God gives, because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. So how do you like this text from the book of Leviticus? You recognize the theme of Leviticus into this text? Yes? No? Maybe? Do you have a question? Are you confused right now? Yeah, you should be confused because this text is not from Leviticus. I just pulled a trick on you. <laughs> not that I want to make fun of the Word of God, but because I want to repeat again the, the, this truth that the message of Leviticus and the message of the New Testament goes hand in hand. This is actually a text from Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, let's click to the next one. And this is the text that I want to, to read. Actually, it's a text that we have discussed quite a lot like, in the last message, but I just want to do a quick review. I am the Lord your God, so do not act like the people in, in Egypt where you used to live or like the people of Canaan where I am taking you. You must not imitate their way of life. So if you look at both texts, you will see that they are basically saying the same thing. Live no longer as they do. You must not imitate their way of life. It's the same message, the same God speaking in different generation, but saying actually the same thing. And we have seen why God is telling them not to imitate. We have seen it quite in detail in the last message. But what we have said in the last message is actually very well described in, the, in Ephesians. It's why? Why are, aren't we to live like they do? Because their minds are full of darkness. They are broken. They wander far from the life that God gives. How many of you want to live far from the life that God gives? I have lived that life before, a long time ago. I'm not interested to live the life far, the, far from the life that God lives. I want to live close. I want to receive the fullness. I want to live fully the life that God has in store for us. And they have closed their hearts and minds. They have hardened their hearts. They have no sense of shame. And we see uh, descriptions of our generation today. The permissiveness that we have in our generation. No sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. This is the message of Leviticus spoken by the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. Do you agree with that? Yes? Okay. So some of you agree, but you should have all agreed. Because it's true. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we see in these texts that God's desire is to have a holy people separated from the abominations of the other nations so that they may enjoy His blessing, this presence. Because if you separate yourself 
and you go after God and you seek the full life that he has for us, you will enjoy so much from the Lord. You will enjoy his promise, you will enjoy his inheritance, you will enjoy everything that God has, his, his daily grace and everything. When we read the book of Leviticus, we find so many ceremonies, sacrifices, restrictions, rules, which may at first reading seem to be meaningless to us who live in the New Testament, who live in this modern generation. But when you dig a bit in the book of Leviticus, you find that all of these rules, sacrifices, uh, are actually have a goal. They have a very, very clear purpose. God has a very, very clear purpose. And this purpose is, we will find it on the next, next slide, Leviticus 20, 26. This is the purpose that God has for you and for me. And we have seen it already. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. This is wonderful. God wants you and me for himself. Is that something bad in that? Is that good? Yes. It's really good. If God wants me on his side and he is on my side and he has a desire for me, I say yes to the Lord. I remember the, the night that I was converted. I actually had a very dramatic conversion that night. I heard the voice of the Lord. Uh, I, I'm not making a story. It's really like that that it happened. I heard the voice of the Lord. He spoke my name. And he asked me if I was satisfied with my life. If I had found what I had been looking for. I have lived in permissiveness. I have lived a life of freedom. I, had, I was living in, in drugs. You know my testimony before for so many years. I, I was in full darkness. And when the Lord asked me that night, calling my name, are you happy with what you've done with your life? Of course, I was not. I was miserable. I was really miserable. Nine years living in the darkness. I was 25 years old. I didn't have hope for the future. My girlfriend, who is now my dear wife, was going to, to leave her. Because I was lost. I was completely lost. She was pregnant of a second child. And I, I didn't think it was really important. I was just thinking about me. And when God says, if you are ready, I'm going to f help you find what you were looking for. You didn't know why. This is exactly what I'm talking about. To find and to seek that full life that God has and that so many people have not found. So God says, I want you to be holy. But we, we have problem with the word holy in our generation. It has lost it, the, the beauty. That the, I, we've talked already about that, but I have more to say about, about this because it's so, so important that we discover the, the full meaning of the word holy. And on the next slide, I want to show you something. If you want to change the word holy for the word whole, it will help you to understand more closer the meaning, the intended meaning of the, of the world. Whole, complete, perfect, uh, without flaw, the, the, the maturity, the likeness of Jesus. Like th Think in, in terms like that. If you read it in, in this way, then you will find, you shall be whole. To me, for, the, the, for I, the Lord, I am whole, I am perfect, and I have separated you from the people that you should be mine. This is what God wants for you and for me today. Say amen, because this is awesome. Amen. This, is, this is great. This is, a, this is found, you see, many people, they look at the book of Leviticus, says, this is not for us, this is full of, you know, ugly things, blood and sacrifice and everything, but this is the message. This is a good message. This is a wonderful message. I want you to be whole, to be perfect. You've lost something. You have become broken because of sin. And I want you to, be, to recover the fullness of that. Whole, holy, uh, brings the idea, the state, think this way, the state in which Adam and Eve were intended to live, to live in before the fall. This is the beauty. You know, they, they were innocent. They were naked, they didn't know. They were pure. They, there was no per perversions yet, no corruption at that time. It was beauty. It, nature was there. Uh, enjoyment was there. 
Uh, no sin was there. No defilement was there. God was there. Wasn't it wonderful? To think about how this is the state in which you and I were created to live in, but the fall came, and it took it all away, and we became broken. Imagine your life today without the effect of sin. Ay, wow, it's even hard to just stop and try to think about it. Because since, since we are a little child, as soon as our mind became conscious that there is a world outside and that we could grasp intellectual reasoning, since this beginning in our life, we have been exposed to a broken world. Everything about us has been broken. Evil, anger, fighting, lying, in the, 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 it goes on and on. Since our childhood, we were used to grow into this broken world. So now, try to imagine your life without the effect of sin without filth, without perversion or corruption. The state that God is bringing us in is this wholeness, free from shame, free from guilt, free from condemnation. This is the message that God has for you this morning. Please say amen to God. Amen. This is what God is talking about. You know, think about God in this way. God is the most beautiful person. Think of someone in your life that is, you can say this is a beautiful person. I'm not talking about beautiful in the cover of a magazine. We, we, we know it's not always very beautiful under, but we're talking about beauty of character. Somebody who is noble. Somebody that you can admire. Somebody that has love to give. Somebody that is attractive. Somebody that shines something, life, and it brings you to be a better person. It brings the best out of you. Think of that beautiful person. Well, God is this multiplied by 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, multiplied by 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 to infinite numbers. It's a big number. It's the perfection of God. So God is the most beautiful person. When we were singing this morning, glorious, glorious, you are glorious. Glory is also a synonym of that. Glory is absolute, heavenly beauty is without any, any flaw or anything. It's, it's the perfection of beauty, the, the, the light and the, the, the glory. God is glorious. God is beautiful. Uh, he's complete. God is balanced. You know, God has all of these qualities, all of these attributes, but he's perfectly in balance. He's perfectly in control of, of who he is. You know, for us, we have so many flaws in our character. We wake up in the morning, we're not happy, and if somebody talks to us, rah, 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 or somebody does something to us, and it's hard to control. Sometimes we get impatient, we are tired, even though we might most of the time be a nice person, but sometimes we, we, we lose it. Not God. There is no flaw in God. God is absolutely what a person ought to be like. So that's why when we think about holiness, we should not be afraid of this world. Holiness is the best that, the best you can think of, is the best you can become. And this is what God wants to feel. Think, think about that. God is filled with love, joy, peace. The, the, the fruit of the Spirit in you, the Holy Spirit is God, isn't it? He is living in you. And as He has come in you, He has started the process of developing you into this person like God. And we read it in Ephesians, we read it in Galatians. It's the beauty of transformation into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So God wants you to be whole just like that. Hi, uh, you want to, to come nearer? <laughs> Hallelujah. And he looks at us and our brokenness and he says to us, you too shall be whole because I am whole. Do you desire to be whole? Yes. yes? Well, only, this, only the one side this, this morning. I don't know what's wrong with that side of the room. Every time I ask a question, only that side uh, answer on this one. Hallelujah. So yes, we want to be what God made us to be. With all the elements of your personality, functioning 
as they were intended and express in balance. God calls you to be that beautiful person. Look at your neighbor and tell them, God calls you to be a beautiful person. This is so wonderful. Now you feel good. Now you feel good. That was worth to come to Lighthouse today just to have someone tell you that you are beautiful. We are so used to see brokenness and feel our own brokenness in the world that we live in. We know hurt. We have hurt others. We have been hurt by others. We cannot and all our own weaknesses so much. God knows all about our human brokenness. And he knows it's all about sin. And his love reaches out to us this morning. He says, you shall be whole because I am whole. That's my purpose. That is the message of Leviticus. And actually, this is the message of the old Bible. This is a book of, of uh, redemption. Th this theme is developed throughout uh, the Bible. Amen? Amen? God is determined to heal man's brokenness and make man whole again, men and women, I, I mean. And he knows how to do it. How many believe that God knows how to do it? Yes. And you know, you know how he started it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you see, it worked. I says this, this side doesn't answer, and now we have someone. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we have here, when they came after 400 years of living under Egyptian lifestyle, God says, don't do like that. Don't imitate them. And then he brings them to Sinai, and now he will just teach them and reveal his love, reveal his intention. And his method for bringing wholeness into you and me, the first thing is, separation. You will not be like them. You will not imitate them. Think about that. Our world is drawing us to agree, to tolerate what they tolerate, to embrace what they embrace. And then on the other side, God says, hey, take my side. It's better. If you have a conflict between the world side and God's side, take my side. You belong to me now. You're different. Choose. And, and this is uh, constantly a choice and a decisions that we will be forced to make every day. You go to the office, there's a, an atmosphere there. You go in the school, there's an atmosphere there. There are people who, 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 who run the crowds, people of influence everywhere we go. And if you want to <coughs> claim or if you want really to be the person that God says that you belong to me, it, it will not be easy for you. Because you are still living in this broken world. There is still a brokenness in each one of us because of our sinful nature. But God says, I want you to separate yourself. Think like me. Be like me. Uh, accept my word. Live by it. And this is hard. This is hard to do that. And you will see it this morning. Because when you choose to side with God's pattern of life, pattern of thinking and of speaking, you will have many enemies around you. You will have many enemies around you. So God understand that, that uh, 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 process of separation because we are, we are broken, having been involved in a broken race. So God must separate us in order to free us from the conformity and the thought patterns and the attitudes that govern our broken society. This needs to change our view, our approach of life, our goal, our intention, what we seek after, our ambitions. It needs to be based on, on the character of God, on, on the best that God has for us. God says, I want to bring you into something much better, into wholeness. So choose, choose me. And we find in Leviticus, two, uh, the book is divided in two divisions. The first part, uh, just wait, stay on the previous one. The first part speaks to man's needs. We have seen it, deals with sinfulness, and it presents God's answer to that need. The second part reveals God's, what God expects to make us uh, whole, just like, like we said now. That's why the book of Leviticus is full of Jesus Christ. The book of Leviticus is the greatest prefiguration of the person and of the work of Jesus Christ. The priesthood is the prefiguration of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. The sacrifices to allow sinful 
people and perfect people to approach a holy God is the sacrifice that Jesus Christ himself has been and he is our mediator. We have seen that in much detail uh, previously. So going back to the uh, short review of the previous message, after 430 years of Egyptian lifestyle, here they are discovering God. And I, I just as we have reviewed Leviticus 18, that's the next slide, we have discussed that in details in the last message. Give the following instructions to the people of Israel, I am the Lord your God. And this has been repeated like, how many times in the book of, of uh, Leviticus. I am the Lord your God. I am God. I am your God. I am your Lord. I am holy. And you belong to me. So that this is the uh, authority of God and the covenant of God. Do not act like them. Keep my laws by living by them. I am the Lord. And then right after that, there is a list, a long list in uh, chapter 18, and we started the, in the last message of that. And it starts with sexual confusion. And that's, uh, not, don't be surprised, please, this morning, this is what we're going to talk about. It's not a subject that we often talk in churches, and we have talked a lot about this the, the first part, these two points on the last message, we have closed with these ones. And today we're going to move on to something a bit more drastic. So don't, 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 <laughs> don't whatever. Just stay with me for a while. Leviticus 18, none of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness and the Lord. And here we see that this expression is mentioned 17 times in this chapter only, to uncover his nakedness. It says, don't do it to your father, this is his nakedness. Don't do it to your mother or to your brother, this is nakedness. And we discussed that aspect last time, that the nakedness of a man or a woman belongs to his spouse. It is covered, it is, it is protected, it is intended to be in the confine of a husband-wife relationship. God ordained uh, the marriage and the Garden of Eden. And God says it is not good for man to be alone. And then he made male and female. And then he blessed them. The two shall leave their, their parents and they will become one. And that is the order, the social order, the moral order that God has established from the beginning. But with the nations and all of this and they have lost this God is bringing them to uh, Sinai and he's going over you are mine now you will live according to my laws and you are not going to have incestuous relationship and we discussed that quite a, a lot and to uncover his nakedness means to approach to go near with the intent of uncover means to denude especially in a disgraceful sense, and nakedness is the nudity of a woman's part. And it is called, some of them are called by God, uh, uh, confusions. This is a confusion. Some of these things, like the one that, the, the, this one, you, you shall not take a woman and the daughter, or the daughter and the, and the mother together. This is a confusion. So these ancestral relationships are called by God confusions. Okay, we have seen that last time. So I'm not started in our message today yet, okay. <sighs> And then you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife so to make yourself unclean with her. And we talked about adultery or unfaithfulness that is lightly called having an affair today which is quite accepted uh, in this world today. You see that all the time. You know, because we are so affected by the pornographic world or the over-sex um, media uh, presentation, the pornography industry generates more revenues annually than all the major sports company put together, national football, national hockey, uh, boxing, uh, uh, whatever it is, basketball, put them all together, pornography generates more income than all of these put together. $13 billion in 2006. From age 8 to 18, a, a young person will see 93,000 sexual scenes in the media and 72,000 of them will be premarital or extramarital. 
93 to 72, that's a pretty big uh, thing. So in all of the sexual scenes that they will have seen, or the um, sexual and content, and even though it's not sometimes always full sexual content, they will see that most of them are premarital, not married, or extramarital outside of the marriage with uh, cheating and, and unfaithfulness. So a young person from the age of 18 to 8 to 18 will have seen that amount. How do you think it, you, don't you think it will affect any of their uh, behavior and their acceptance and their, their, that's why we see a brokenness, a broken worldview, broken attitudes, broken understanding from growing up in a broken society. Understand that? It's not so positive, but it is, it is the truth. And just to make it a bit more, you see it in the New Testament. If you click to the next one, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul find this horrible sin mentioned in Leviticus chapter 18, practice in the church. A man as his father's wife in the church, and the church continue to exercise the, 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 the gifts of the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues and do everything like they would normally do. They ignore it, it's not a big deal. And Paul is furious about that because the church is not dealing with this. This is basic. This is from the beginning. This is God's holiness, God's separation. You shall not do any of these detestable sin or these abomination that God calls in the Old Testament. It is wildly accepted in the church of Corinth. And we do the same thing. We see that all over us. We don't know how to measure anymore, how to read, and how to, 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 to govern. It's, it's, it's something that is quite serious. Let's continue. This is the previous message. Now we start. After the sexual confusion, the first list, now we move to abominations and perversion. I'm sorry, but this is what the Bible says. I'm I'm in that chapter, so stay with me. Leviticus 18.21 Do not permit any of your children to be offered as a sacrifice to Molech, for you must not bring shame on the name of, the, of your God. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Always repeated, I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is detestable sin or an abomination. Verse 23, as uh, the, the two, one verse as a man, the other one as a woman, I put them all together. Man and woman shall not lie with an animal to defile themselves with it. It is a perversion. These are the terms that God is using. And God says, you must not commit any of these detestable sins. Any, not one. Not this one, more than the other one. And I want to just make a little uh, parenthesis here. When you go to chapter 20 of the book of Leviticus, you will see the punishment that God has. Very strict. There's capital punishment for many of them. But that's not the point I want to discuss. What I want to discuss is that punishment for homosexuality is not more s severe than for incest or for unfaithfulness. These are all abominations to God. So not more, because we tend to see certain sins more like ugly or detestable than others. But to God, when, when, when you look at the punishment of that, how God sees the big picture, he puts them all on the same level. And we will talk a little bit more about that a bit, a bit further. The reasoning of God, if you look Okay, here, this text here. You must not commit any of these detestable sins or abomination. These people have practiced them. So you do not defile the land and give a reason to the land to vomit you. Whoever commits any of these detestable sins will be cut off. So without going into the, the, the details, it seems that there, what God is saying, there is a consequence. You, you practice this, there would be a consequence. When a nation practices this, there would be a consequence over the, the nations. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness lifts up a nation, but sin is a disgrace in any society. So when these individual acts become the norm, then there will be a, a result 
and this nation. And if you look at what is happening today in the world, we feel that the Lord is coming soon, that there will be a judgment, that already judgment is started. The economy is falling. People can, uh, can don't know what to do. The government don't know how to govern their own people anymore. People are in the streets. Uh, there's confusion. And people are not moving forward. They are, they are falling apart. They are falling in pieces. And the reasoning of God is that don't let it happen to you. Don't live like that. Don't imitate them. Separate. God has something better for us to, to go in that direction and to, uh, to approve, to tolerate, to say yes. It's not going to, to make your life better. It's going to have a negative. Because they have defiled themselves this way, the land vomited them. So what we need to do today is pray. Pray, confess the sin like Nehemiah and many of the prophets of the Old Testament over the sins of the nations. If you look at the book of Jude, you will see a mention to how Lot felt toward the, the, the people of Sodom. How he felt like about the burning loss that they had. He, they used, the New, the New Testament used very specific terminology to talk about all of these sorts of sinfulness. Christians are to be different in every area of our life. If the Holy Spirit, if God, the Holy Spirit, lives in you and in me, shouldn't we become more like God? Shouldn't we like, think like Him, act like Him, speak like Him? Okay, let's go back to offering children as sacrifice through uh, fire to Molech, because it brings shame to the name of God. What is Molech? Molech is a giant metal statue in form of a man with a bull's head. Each image had outstretched forearm and a fire was lit in or around the statue. Babies were placed in the statue's arms while fire was there. And when a couple sacrificed their firstborn, they believed that Molech would ensure financial prosperity and different kinds of blessings and, uh, you know, ha having more children and having, having more, more, more of whatever they want to have more. This happens in the nations. It happens thousands of times. And then you are thinking, how can these people do these horrible things? Are you thinking that? Only on that side, not on that side. <laughs> okay, let me ask you a serious question. Is that very much different from abortion? <clears throat> the statue of Moloch, the parents or the mother, bring the child to fire so that her life or their life will benefit from a blessing. So here in our generation, we have couples who say, I can't afford a kid, let's abort. I don't want the kid, I want my life back. I want my f financial freedom. I want my sexual freedom without the consequence of getting pregnant and having a child. You're like, people think like this. You know that. I'm not announcing you uh, anything. Isn't it this similar to bringing the child to Molech? If you have seen videos of what happens in abortion a baby, a little human being that has already been conceived, that is developing, that has little hands, that has little, little neck and little legs, what happened to them? Do you want me to give you a descriptions, a visual graphic descriptions of what happened? Yes or no? Yes. No. Say no. Because it's not something that we want to do this morning. But to, to present a child to the abortionist doctor and present it to Moloch is pr mo about the same motivations. Having a blessing, having a freedom, having financial freedom, having my life back, having, it's, it's more or less the same thing. Let's move on. You are not to lie sexually or have sexual relationship with a male as you would with a woman. It is detestable or an abomination. Today we call it alternative lifestyle. God says it's an abomination. 
it's it's such a hot topic today and i'm not at the topic i i don't wish today to tell you what i think how i feel about it because that's not my role i just want to be honest about what the bible says and try to call us to be whole as god is whole and to understand what god is saying because Today, many, many Christians, many young Christians of this generation, they have so much brought up into this broken way, this broken world, that they cannot understand why it's wrong, homosexuality. Why it's a sin? Because today, if you say it is sin, or if you express yourself it is an abomination, you will be accused to be a homophobe, or that your speech is a hate speech. Because, oh, is that true? If, if you express your opinion on a hot topic like this, are you hating someone or are you just talking about someone? As someone that I know very well told me one day they were working in the, in the office, group of friends, they eat together, they have fun, they share food together, and one day, it was when, you know, the gay marriage was a hot topic at the time, and the question is asked by one of them, what do you think of gay marriage? What happened in the room? <laughs> Nobody dared to say anything. So after a long moment of silence, that person says, it's not normal. Wow, everybody just got so angry. But she says, so you ask the opinion. <laughs> So I'm just, just giving the opinion of that. But it's like you cannot, you cannot do that. According to studies, and I, will, I think I will skip that because we, we are coming to the end of the message. But there are many, so many statistics and studies that I have. If you want, I can give you uh, the email of, of these ones. But let me give you just one. German sexologist Martin Daneker, who is himself homosexual, says fidelity or faithfulness between homosexual men living in a committed relationship is a fairy tale. There is no such a concept in the, in the male uh, homosexual community of a faithfulness to one uh, like the couple will always be faithful until death. It is a concept based on Judeo-Christianity -Christian and it is a, they don't think like that. That's what he says. He is himself an homosexual. Daneker interviewed 900 male respondents living in what he called a steady relationship. These couple are committed to one another and he says 83% of them 747 on 900 said that they had had frequent homosexual contacts outside of their steady relationship within the 12 months. And many of the studies says that homosexual um, public in the Journal of Sex Research sounds that the range for number of sexual partners was 100 to 500 and some of them up to 1,000. Some people will say today, and you hear it a, a lot as an argument, many justify homosexuality on the basis of love. How can it be wrong to love someone of my own sex? Love, how can it be wrong to love? That, that's basically the question. And I want to read something that, uh, it's from someone that some of you know but I'm not going to say any, anything more about that. Somebody who has been in Lighthouse at some point about the, uh, what happened in Orlando. And this is what he wrote on his Facebook wall. I have tried my best to stay away from Facebook today. I would just like to say one thing in response to the devastating events of Orlando. This is particularly addressed to my friends who I know oppose homosexuality. This was an attack on the LGBT community, my community, my people. This happened in an area in which we should feel safe and free to express affection for those we love. And over 50 of us are dead. We need you to stand for us. We may disagree on what is acceptable in the sight of God, but please remember that we are people too. This month in particular, keep love in mind.
And uh, okay, the message is very simple. We need you to stand for us because and we, we have a right to, to love one another. But one thing that I don't want to comment on this, I just want to comment on one point here that goes with our message. When it says, we may disagree on what is acceptable in the sight of God. What, what does that mean, that sentence? We may disagree on what is acceptable in the sight of God. It means you and I, in our relationship, we should not really consider what God says or how God thinks. It doesn't matter what, what, what you think that God thinks. That's not the point. You should just stand for me. Don't think about God. Don't, you know, that's, that's what it means. We may disagree on what is acceptable in God's sight, but I want your support. We may disagree on, on God. Should we disagree on God? So, so that's, that's the point I want, I want to talk about that. So the issue here is not about love. It's about, are we like God? And I'm not talking about hatred and judgment. Please, uh, that's not at all my intention this morning. Because we will see in the New Testament, it's, it's salvation. Like, this is what you were. This is not what you are anymore. So there's grace. There's, there's a, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the message that, see, you do not imitate you don't think like that. You don't do like them. You are mine now. You will be holy, separated, dedicated to me. You, you're with me. You're becoming like me. You, you were broken. You live in a broken society. Your broken society has raised you up with perverted way of life and understanding of how things work in this world. I want you to bring you to be like me, perfect, flawless, pure, uh, beautiful, glorious. You like, is, is that what I'm talking about? Do you understand me? I'm not talking about anger, and I'm not talking about judging and refusing people. That's not at all what I'm saying. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're finishing with that. How would you say to those, I was born this way. God made me an homosexual. It's my nature to be homosexual. I would be against, it would be against my nature to be heterosexual. How, how do we approach a subject like this? The reality in the Bible is that they, you, me, we are all sinners. If you look at this text here, you will see they are all put on the same line. Different sins, different background, this is describing us. This is describing you. All of us had something to do in that list at a certain degree. And that list is not complete. It's just to get us started. You used to indulge in sexual sin, worship idols, unfaithful in marriage, practice homosexuality. Okay, this is chapter 18. But if you look later on in the book of Leviticus, and this is to come in, in one month when I come back, we will continue. These are the social laws, the regulations. Did you know that in Leviticus is where you find you shall love your neighbor like yourself? It is quoted by Jesus and everything. The message of Leviticus is a message of love. It's very practical. Give to the poor. Respect the foreigners. Uh, leave some money in the field for them. If you want to, re there's a, a lot of laws for the, the righteousness of our society for, for love. It's all based on love. The message of love starts from from this book so here we have chapter 18 and here you have from chapter 21 to the end of the book thieves greedy people drunkard abusive cheating people none of these will inherit the kingdom of God some of you were like that so we come from from this this background Christian comes out of all kinds of different backgrounds. It doesn't matter if you had been homosexual or not. We're not judging you more harshly, or we should not at least, though it's not true. Sometimes we, we do. But here in this text, Paul is not. He says, this is what some of you are. You come out of that, okay? Some of you were homosexual. Some of you were thieves. So, what's the difference? Some of you were unfaithful. 
Some of you had abusive language. What's the difference? Some of you had ancestral relationship, or it had been done to you. That's why we are broken people, because there are all kinds of sin, but sin is sin. You understand that? So click the rest. In the past, some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And I like the way that it is said here, you have been purified from sin. You have been dedicated, separated, consecrated to God. This is your choice. You have been put right with God by the Lord Jesus Christ. These verb tense talk, this is done deal. It's been done in our lives from broken to wholesome. This is done. God has done it in Jesus Christ. You get saved to serve his single purpose. Listen to that. You were bought at a price. You are no longer your own. You are becoming a vessel of honor and the temple of the Holy Spirit. And these are only a few uh, adjectives or attributes of what you and I have become or are meant to be. I repeat that, and please repeat it with me. Bought at a price. At a price. No longer your own. A vessel of honor in the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the message of Leviticus. This is the message of Corinthian. Sin is sin. God wants to take us from our brokenness and bring us into his wholesomeness or to, to be really different and transform and everything. There is so much more here that I have to stop because our time is already past, but the message of God is a good message. Amen. He wants to take us from our brokenness, bring us to be like Him and serve His purpose, and this is awesome. Me, that's what I want to do. But it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Because when you move from a broken society and you want to express yourself and live in the freedom of God with the mind of God, the pattern of thinking of God, of course you will be verbalizing this, expressing it. You will have many enemies. You will be accused of being really bad and to this one. But we're not judging. We are here to offer salvation. This message is good. You have been purified from sin. You have been dedicated to God, become right with God. This is a good message that we have. So our, uh, your, our uh, intention and our attitude toward people should reflect the message of Jesus Christ. Now when Jesus uh, met with the woman in adultery, caught in adultery, it was also a sin from Leviticus chapter 18, wasn't it? What did Jesus tell her? I don't condemn you. But we are many times good to condemn. We, we, we have a condemning mouth. But Jesus says, I don't condemn you because there's hope for you. There's a transformation for you. Paul says, this is what you were. Some of you come from this background. Whether you were thieves or you were unfaithful, there is hope for all of us. It's the message of Leviticus. It's the message of God. It's the message of the New Testament. You shall be whole like me, because I am whole, perfect, beautiful, glorious, live the best life with confidence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you so much.